Hi, Marcella Smith. I am so happy that you're here with me to present to Writing It Real members today. They know that I'm Sheila Bender, although some haven't met me in person, so this is a good opportunity to almost meet me in person. But I want to start by reading your extensive and wonderful bio to show my Writing It Real members why I'm featuring you today, because you're a person who can help us who are wanting to publish our books whether that's with independent presses or big presses or self-publishing from your wealth of experience. And as they will learn later as we're talking, they can actually employ you to help them, which I'm about to do to increase my visibility in some of the books that I've put out through Writing It Real. So let me begin by saying that Marcella Smith is a consultant offering expert support to authors and publishers in strategic marketing and business development she specializes in working with independent presses. Marcella is known and respected in the industry for her knowledge of publishers, industry best practices, and in maximizing sales to the customer, whether in a traditional bookstore or in non-traditional outlets. Prior to establishing her own business, Marcella was a senior executive at Barnes & Nobles who worked with publishers and suppliers to develop new business, expand title selection, strengthen relationships, and drive increased profitability. Her career there spanned over 20 years, during which time she held a number of positions, including Director of Vendor Relations, overseeing the management of all aspects of Barnes & Noble's operations, logistics, financial relationships with its suppliers, including terms negotiations. In her early years at Barnes & Noble, she established her commitment to the presence of the independent presses on the bookshelves at Barnes & Noble through her participation in the Small Press Distribution Committee sponsored by the Independent Publishers Group, and later by serving two terms on the board of the Independent Book Publishers Association. And she continues as a member of that organization, judging each year for their Independent Press Ben Franklin Awards. Before Marcella joined Barnes & Nobles in 1989, she was a freelance writer and agent. Earlier in her career, she worked at Simon & Schuster as a marketing manager and at St. Martin's Press as a special sales manager. Marcella, I am so happy to be talking with you. You have the full package. Seems to me that your career and your interests have spanned everything that we as writers wonder about. So welcome to Writing It Real, and I'm sure all my members are feeling really excited about being able to talk to you and learn about how to get in touch with you. So. I think that we decided a good way to begin would be by you showing us some books and kind of talking about what you know about how they traveled to the bookshelves where we'd find them in a store like Barnes & Noble. Well, actually, this is a really good question. And then thinking about, because I, I knew that this was one of the questions you were gonna ask me. And so I thought a lot about this, about the books on my bookshelf and how they got there. And I realized as I looked at the bookshelf I have here and thinking about the bookshelf I have at home uh, in another location where I also spend some time is that it all, almost all of it was recommended by somebody I knew or a book reviewer that I knew because I'd been reading that book reviewers reviews for who knows how long, John Leonard and a whole host of others. Actually, I realized that that's how books come to life that they go from the author to a publisher, whether that's self-published or published by a traditional publisher, is that somebody is excited about it. Somebody is a passionate advocate for that work. And sometimes that passionate advocate turns out to be the author. Sometimes it's the author in conjunction with an agent. But then that passion and enthusiasm, once the publisher has acquired the book, is then passed on to the book buyer in a bookstore, someplace like Barnes and Noble, or even the Tattered Cover in Denver, and and the host of other books around the bookstores that are around the country that that do wonderful jobs of book selling, no matter what their size. Anyway, so what happens is that the publisher has a sales meeting through two or three times a year and brings in all the sales reps from all the territories across the country, and then the editor makes a presentation for their titles to the sales force and to the marketing committee and the publicity and all of all of the people who then support the books landing into the general marketplace into bookstores and every place where books are sold and the sales rep then for that particular bookstore account 
goes out to that particular bookstore or dozens and dozens of bookstores or goes to an office like Barnes and Noble or the former Borders or Tattered Cover in Denver and makes the presentation for that particular list of books which are gonna be published in let's say the fall of 2020. And it's at that point where the book buyer in the store then makes a decision about what to buy, how many to buy, do they buy it at all? But the reality is, and I go back to what I said before, which is that most books that are on my bookshelf were recommended to me by someone I knew. And what has happened over time is that the publisher's sales rep and the book buyer, whether it's the owner of a one store or it's the buyer for a particular category for a large number of stores, have developed a relationship. So the buyer knows when the sales rep comes to call to present the fall random house list, let's say, and the sales rep is particularly enthusiastic, maybe about an author that the book buyer's never heard of before, but is new to the publishing house. And the publishing house is incredibly enthusiastic about this new author that nobody's heard of before, but they're gonna make a big to-do about this author. And so then the book buyer, because they trust the sales rep who's presenting the, the information about the title and the author and what they're gonna to do to support the author, then takes a position on the book itself for them, buying whatever quantity they think, think is appropriate to match what the publisher's promotion is gonna be for that particular title. And so that's how I got from my comment about almost all the books on my shelf were recommended to me by somebody or other. And in most cases, it is someone I know. I recently read Educated by Tara Westover, which I had heard about because I read the book review and I'm the Sunday Times book review on a regular basis. And I'd heard about it and I thought, well, maybe kind of interesting. And it became a bestseller. And I thought, well, I don't, that doesn't usually do anything for me. I don't care. I mean, I, I depend on my own reading and thinking and people that I talk to and whatnot. So, but a really good friend of mine who's a great reader said that she had read Tara Westover's Educated and liked it a lot. And I thought, well, I like Alana. She has good taste. I'll take a look. And I was hooked and loved it and understood why it had become such a tremendous, tremendous bestseller because it touches on so many issues in so many people's lives. Um, and it's a rags to riches story in the end. It's an American story of dragging your own self out of a difficult situation and by the sheer grit and determination and some good luck, she changes her life, which is what she wanted to do. And she was able to change her life. And it's a great, great story. Yeah. So what if you're publishing with a really small press, a very small niche press, or you're self-publishing, and because you, you said passion, whether it's the author's passion or an editor's passion or an agent's passion or the publisher's passion, how does somebody come from a very small niche, self-publishing or small press, and engage sales reps? Or at this point, it would be book buyers because... They wouldn't have a sales rep other than their own small press rep. Is there really a chance that that kind of publication or publishing uh, choice could get that far? It could, actually. It doesn't happen all the time, that's for sure. But it is possible because there is also, aside from the traditional sales force that comes from places like Little Brown and Random House and Simon and & Schuster and Putnam and all of the Penguin and all of the big houses, is that there are a number of, a significant number of independent sales reps who represent smaller publishers who will take on a first time publisher if the book fits into the kinds of books and publishers that they carry in their bag. So for instance, there's Tom Doherty Associates in, uh, I think he's in Indiana. And most of the books that he sells are either children's books or they're sports related books. And some car mechanical kinds of books. So Tom is a good person to approach if you're writing a book in this category and you wanna start a publishing company or you are a small publishing company because he has dozens and dozens of publishing clients, some very large, some small, some medium, 
And so if you can convince Tom and his sales force, because he has guys working for him selling to bookstores all across the country. So if you can convince them that what you're going to do to support the book in terms of publicity and promotion and the idea of the book and how it competes in the marketplace, then these guys may be very likely to take it on. There really is a route. Yes, there is a there is a route. There is is a route. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm going to interject because I know you supply us authors out there with a lot of help. Is that something that you do as part of your menu of services? Do you help a small press published book author or a a self published author to connect with these sales reps all over the country? Absolutely. I have connections with the independent publishers group, with Tom Doherty, and with a number of other groups around the country. So oh. I can I can write to them. I can pick up the phone. I can tell them that I'm working with somebody that I think makes sense for them, that's a match for them, because each one of them has different strengths. Right. And so you want to find the right fit yeah. for both the author and the and the book itself, which is the most important thing, is the book itself, and yeah. the sales rep group that would do the best job for that particular right well it is such exciting news to hear that this is that there are independent sales reps and that person like you who can connect us writers to that because most of us have heard the word publicist we've heard the word agent we do or do not use those those people but they're not really the people who do what you're saying the publicist deals with the book when it it's already published and out there, you might want to help us understand the difference between, I'm sure it's vast, between independent sales rep and publicist as we talk today. Maybe this is a good time and I have tons of questions for you. So one of the things we were going to talk about, so keep in mind that this idea of what do these different people do, agents, publicists, sales reps, but Mm -hmm. we, we talked about where you come from in helping writers is that Every author needs to feel that they've given their book their best shot, you said. Yeah. And that starts with the writing, of course. And right. from there, let's say they, they wrote a good book. They already know it's good somehow, whether it's trusted readers or, they, yeah, trusted readers say, this is a great book, it should be published. Mm-hmm. Among the list I have in my notes about what you meant by good shot was, of course, write a good book. But let's say the, the writer knows the book is good. Or you might want to back up a little bit more (laughs) too about how do you know your book is good. But all the production things that go on include good proofreading, include good cover design, include interior design, blurbs on your book. That's all in production. And I hope, could you address some of what that is and, and what that requires of an author, why it's important? It's important because, unfortunately, there's a certain attitude feeling about a lot of books which have been published by the author that is suspect because people feel it doesn't have the quality or the stamp of approval of the industry people who know what's what and so this is why i always recommend that you may know that you've written a good book but you also need to hire somebody like Sheila Bender or other people who can help you edit your book to make sure that in fact, B does follow A and C follows B and that there is some logic and that this character who died here doesn't suddenly show up three chapters later. That's really important. And it is important to develop a team that you have, which is the editor, the publisher, the designer. And then once you've got all of that together, and you know that you're gonna have a good package as it were, then you could present yourself to a publicist and say, this is what I want. Here's who I think the audience is. I think here's how I would see finding that audience. And then how do you, the publicist, see about finding that audience? And there are again publicists who are independent publicists who do not work for publishing houses, but do take on projects from a variety of self-published authors and from the smaller publishing houses who can't afford a full-time publicist, but do from time to time hire an independent publicist. And they're very, they have great reputations and they do a really good job. So when you say once you have that team together, you also mean once that team did its work and the book is ready for the book. Correct, correct. And that leads me to the question about I personally have a team like that together. 
myself. Mm -hmm. I didn't hire one company to reprint some of my out of print books. I hired individuals to do these steps that we're talking about, Mm -hmm. but we will talk about blurbs that that's something the author has to do as well. But there are all these companies out as well Mm -hmm. that promise the world and their menu of services. And I believe from my own dippings in through clients of mine who have been researching them, that they may be overpriced, yep. underskilled, you bet. Um, not really do the marketing they say they're going to do if you purchase that part. Yeah. So I'm imagining you would be the kind of person who could be employed to help a writer figure that part out if yes. they were fortunate enough to find their own team. Yes. There are a couple of good resources here at this juncture, if I could introduce. There's Belonging to poets and writers and subscribing to poets and writers is a great way to find out a lot about A, what's going on in the industry, and B, who's who in the industry that helps poets and writers in terms of publicists and sales reps and printers, designers, all those kinds of people, because they show up in interviews in the magazine, and it's a great connection to make, actually. And I I have a host of other connections that maybe you'll include links to other organizations where you can garner a lot of information about who's doing what to whom and who does what well and all that kind of stuff. Absolutely. That'd be very, very valuable. This video will be embedded in uh, some information about you and now the links that you're suggesting. Say we got that far. Say we, uh, we got this good book. We got the team. We have the publicist or maybe not if we haven't hired one but we've got to get the book distributed. Mm-hmm. So now what, what is distribution? Well, distribution is actually making that connection with the sales rep group that I talked about before. And I'll go back to Tom Doherty or the independent publishers group just because they're top of mind in, for me uh, these days. So what you do then is that you, the now the author who's become a publisher in fact, because if you've developed this team and you now are publishing your work, go to to Tom Doherty or to IPG or to SBU, Small Press United, and you make a case for why they should take on your book to sell to the libraries and bookstores and wholesalers and whatnot. And so you're going to do that because now you've hired a publicist who has a reputation that they're going to recognize that they know what's what. And you have a finished book, you have a professional presentation to make, and you have some kind of marketing plan that you can show them about why you think your book would sell, who the customer is, and how to reach that customer. And so that's what, that's how we get from here to there in 25 okay. words. Or less. Oh. <laughs> if you were to have been lucky enough to be published by a small independent press, yeah. they would have some of that in place. But But my understanding is that even with the big presses, the author has a lot to do in terms of keeping the visibility of their book and marketing. And maybe that's the cross between the writer and the publicist. But um, most books, as I understand it, don't get a lot of that help after a short while. But most of the money and funds in a big press anyway go to the blockbuster books in terms of getting television, radio, big pages in the New York Times, you know, that kind of stuff. And so us people who publish in niches particularly Mm -hmm. are likely to need to do the work as well, even if a small press took on the book as opposed to self-publishing. Right. But the reality is that a small press would take on the book if that was in their niche already, so that they already have the connections with the places who should review the book mm-hmm. and know people who would be interested in a book with that particular subject. And I know that the big houses get a lot of bad raps because they think that uh, there's always an author who has a sad story about, ah, my sign was for this and my, then my editor left and the publicist I was working with left and then nothing happened and I couldn't make blah, blah, blah. You know, I mean, yes, okay, yeah. these things happen, life happens. But the reality is, is that there are a lot of great editors who are not the big names, who publish a lot of great books. And there are a lot of sales reps within those publishing houses who love lots of different books. I mean, it's easy to sell. I mean, I'm, now I'm going to show you how old I am. Jacqueline Suzanne. It's really easy to sell Jacqueline <laughs> Suzanne or any one of a number of, of those people you can think of. But you know what? Once upon a time, Jacqueline Suzanne was not Jacqueline Suzanne. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of of well-known authors that started out very small 
and ended up great. I think about Scott Peck, for instance, who wrote The Road Less Traveled, mm -hmm. which was published by Simon & Schuster was in the 80s. And the first print was 5,000 copies, and it didn't come out in paperback until five years later. Mm -hmm. And the only reason it sold was that Scott Peck went out and spoke to groups, not necessarily in bookstores, but he went to churches and those kinds of meetings where people went, um, AA meetings, all kinds of personal development kinds of meetings and the word spread. And then the book has sold millions of copies since, just millions of copies since. But it was the author's energy. It's always the author's energy mm -hmm. that carries the day. Either the author's energy convinces the sales force that, wow, this author's got some pizzazz, or there's the author himself just goes out or herself and goes out and knocks on doors and says, here I am, and this is my idea, and this is what I've written about, and here's my story, and, and does the legwork. And the same thing happened with Jack Canfield and the Chicken Soup for the Soul, the same thing. They started out, they were published by Health Communications Incorporated, and we started getting a lot of requests for the first Chicken Soup for the Soul, which was about AA. It was about uh, for alcoholics. And I was in a working in a bookstore then. And who knew who Health Communications was? I mean, it was like, okay, but we started getting a lot of requests for it. So we ordered some and we sold them. And then we ordered some more and we sold them. And then we ordered some more and we sold them. And then a sales rep walked in from Health Communications and we said some, and it was a commission rep, not a house rep, but a commission rep who had a whole bunch of publishers in his bag who walked in the store one day and said, uh, and we said, yes, thank God. Now, are you going to have a lot? Because the part of the problem was because it was a startup, the reprints were slow. So they, you'd have some and then you wouldn't get any, and then you'd have some and you wouldn't get any. So finally, they got their act together and Chicken Soup for the Soul. And now, you know, there's like 200 titles and they've sold 200 million copies across the whole list. And it's just a huge story, but it started very small with an idea that would appeal to, admittedly, a broad base because. Clearly, there's Alcoholics Anonymous is a huge organization, but this was one of those, and this is where I go back again to the recommendation and word of mouth is the story. Right. With all of the great successes that have happened in the publishing world, aside from Michelle Obama's becoming, which, I mean, here she's got a platform to start from, but for the rest of us, it all is one by, it's like everything in your life is one by one by one. Right, right. And what happens is that your story, whether it's fiction, nonfiction, it's a gardening book, it's a whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. It's that enthusiasm that you generate, the energy that you bring to it is what carries the day in the end. So the way you're <laughs> helping us, I think, is by mm -hmm. connecting the dots because what happens to an author is you've written the book and you think i finished it you're so excited mm -hmm. right maybe you've gotten as far as getting it designed and put together nicely mm -hmm. and then you feel honestly i know this to be true for myself and for other writers someone it's someone else's job that i i need to write my next book i i can't do all this at the same time right. and what you're doing is filling in the dots because i think one of the reasons we don't feel like we can do it is because we don't know what to do and it right. weighs on us we know what to do when it comes to writing we know we have to start we know the process and the revision and all of that's ahead of us but we've done it so we can do it again but this whole other aspect is a new part to our lives right. and everybody wants that miracle publicist that miracle agent that miracle television show that huge platform that they didn't have to build themselves you know we all want it but the truth is what you're saying, which is, that's not how it happens. <laughs> it happens because you're there, knocking on doors, yeah. dumping yeah. from the book. Yeah. yeah. So to be wise, though, with your energy and, and like to connect with the groups that are going to be helpful, like uh, What Color Is Your Parachute example. Right. Oh, yeah. It's really valuable because, I mean, where do you start? It's all a stab in the dark until you start to focus and think about it. And now I have to say with our COVID-19 times and difficulties probably ensuing with traveling and large group gatherings. If you're trying to do it now, 
you're going to run into new kinds of obstacles. So probably they're beginning to exist even more online. Guest blogging for, for groups that are about what your book Absolutely. is about, getting yourself Absolutely. that way and doing that kind of, of search. So this is really just to connect the dots between you, the writer, you, the book pub, publisher or the publisher that you've been published by, just to be able to know what's happening so that you can keep track of it and do your part. And then how do you market your book? Even if you're on a list, a list of publications, mid-list, right. wherever you are, there's yeah. always more work to be done. Yes. Thank you. And I think you mentioned libraries when you talked about the independent sales rep, but you once told me that libraries had a different sort of distribution uh, where they looked for distributors was different right. than bookstores. Right. How, how does that it, work? It, there, there's a major wholesaler called Baker and Taylor, which caters to the library market. So the publisher's sales rep goes to Baker and Taylor and makes the presentation for the fall list for Random House or for Pete Becker Press, for that matter, it doesn't matter. And then Baker and Taylor buys for their different locations, depending on the number of libraries they're servicing in a certain part of the country, right. the quantity that they need that they feel they're going to be able to sell based on the reviews in Library Journal, for instance, in Publishers Weekly, which are the trade major trade journals, as well as School Library Journal, if you're writing books for young children and for school, for educational purposes. So there is a process there as well. It's just a different segment of the sales that takes place. Now that you brought up places to get your book reviewed, let's start with how does an author get their book reviewed in Publishers Weekly or Library, Library. Journal? Right. Yeah. Well, theoretically, your publicist has connections with Library Journal and with Publishers Weekly and will help you then get your book reviewed there. But there's also Forward Magazine, which is devoted to reviewing books published by smaller independent presses. And they do a really good job of really good reviews and as well as informative articles about how the industry work and who's who and who's doing what to whom and all that kind of stuff. And, and maybe what I do have links to a whole bunch of connections and information sources that you can share with your, your okay. listeners and your- So can an author without a publicist make any good contact with these review? They certainly can with, with Forward Magazine, certainly they can. That's the one that I know that I trust there's another review organization, I think he's still functioning, called Midwest Book Review, mm -hmm. but he's not a reliable reviewer. And everyone who knows, who writes then book reviews for traditional media, mm -hmm. knows that his reviews are not to be trusted. So that brings up another thing, your local newspaper or your yes. biggest local city newspaper, the biggest city. Yes. If you can yes. interest the book reviewer in your book you might have some good luck starting to build right. that platform. Exactly, because the other thing that you as an author can do mm -hmm. is to become a contributor to the local magazine, the local newspaper, the local radio channel. All of those things begin to establish you as somebody who is viable in the media. And if you do that for yourself, then that already proves, because you can have the recordings, you can have the local articles, mm -hmm. you can then, deliver that as part of your package to a publicist and say, look, I know how to get coverage. I do this. I cover the high school sports or I cover the local college team or I cover the local amateur teams in my town because I'm, I'm passionate about baseball or football or whatever. And so this is all the writing that I've done and I'm a regular contributor to the Mason Daily Black. So, oh, you're, you seem to be saying too that even a publisher is a gateway I and mean, is judging whether they should take you on as a client. Correct. Yeah. Correct. It isn't a done deal like because I'm going to pay you, you're going to represent me. You no. have to know that no. you're representable. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Exactly. So, right. back to basics here. We have the book, that's basic. And right. then we need to have, and you mentioned it before, a marketing plan. And mm -hmm. I know from book proposals I've written for publishers that it actually, even though they have the marketing department, you as the author are actually supposed to, in your proposal, uh, write your marketing plan right. and where your book would be on the bookshelves. So right. once again, the author's asked to do the work and Correct. hopefully then they'll pick up from there. But so that marketing plan is really important. 
Yes, it is. Uh, this is something I gather that you help writers and publicists probably figure out for a book. Yes. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So there's all kinds of ways we can use your help. Right. And just to be clear here, huh? it's important for an author to be able to exhibit to a potential publicist and or publisher that they accept their responsibility in the bargain. So because you've made a deal and you've been paid by the publisher, it isn't now that you stop working. It's that you have to continue to work and they count on you to tell them who your connections are. That's the most important thing. And so it's about your credibility. And they know then because you're willing to put your shoulder to the wheel to help them. That's why they ask you all those questions. Who do you know? Where have you been published before? Where did you go to school? Blah, blah, blah. Because they want to know if they do their part, you'll do your part. And that's how it works when authors are successful is that they don't sit back once they've submitted the manuscript and said, oh yeah, I like the jacket or whatever. And maybe they showed up at the sales conference or maybe they weren't asked to do that. Sometimes authors are, sometimes they're not. And then you don't sit back and wait for the publisher to do their job. You then work in collaboration with the publicist to make sure that you're giving them all the information that they could possibly need and then some. Yeah. to be able to do the job and that you're available and you don't just then sit back and wait for them to do their job. You have to do your job. So even if you're with a small press, right? maybe even especially if you're with a small press because they don't right. have much personnel, um, right. it becomes really, really important. And yep. um, if you're out there by yourself as an author, it's doubly important. Right. To, exactly. Because you can, you can work from your marketing plan even if you don't have a publicist. Like right. with authors, you you cited did became famous so there is a question that floats around about if i self-published would a bigger press pick up my book can you address that in any way yes i can it all depends on how hard you work hmm. and what you do again it's the same story <laughs> same story it's okay same story. so uh, it's the same thing you you actually are somehow presenting your book to a public to a bigger publisher and saying, well, actually, what happens is that you have been essentially doing a, a books in the trunk tour yourself. This is the story of John Grisham and the first book that he published. Uh -huh. He might have done it with a publishing house or I know he, yeah, he did it with a very small publishing house. I remember it's all coming back to me now, many, too many years ago. A very small publishing house, Pelican Publishing in New Orleans, Louisiana. And they published mostly regional titles. And this was his, it wasn't a regional title because it, it was his story. And he went out every single weekend to the towns in Louisiana and Alabama and Mississippi. And he went to the libraries. He went to church meetings. He went to Better Business Bureau meetings. He went to any meeting he could go to. And he spoke and he had cartons of books in his trunk. And he sold them out of his trunk as he traveled around. And that's how John Grisham got started. And he got noticed because there was a sales rep from one of the bigger houses, because uh, I think it was published by Doubleday originally. Anyway, one of the sales rep from the uh, big houses happened to be in a local bookstore that it had picked up John Grisham's book. And the people in the bookstore said, Hey, you got to read this guy. He's really good. This is a great story. And so the sales rep bought it, I mean, picked it up, bought it, read it, took it back to the home office and said, I think there's something here. And lo and behold, here we are, I don't know how many books later or how many bestseller lists he's been on, which is not to say that you're gonna end up on the bestseller list. But again, the author went out on the weekends, he was a lawyer supporting his family, but on Saturdays and Sundays, that's what he did. He got in his car with a whole trunk full of books and went places and found libraries and churches and meetings of different kinds to make his presentation and sell the books out of the trunk of his car. And here we are, all these, how many years later is that? A lot of that is like that. I mean, Tom Clancy is another one mm -hmm. who was published by a very small, I can't even remember their name now, it's very small military naval publishing house. In fact, I think it was the U.S. Naval Institute published it because he was well connected with some people there. But again, it was very small. And again, he just reached out to the people he knew 
who would find the book interesting, because I can't even remember the name of the first Tom Clancy right now, he then reached out to these military guys who read the book, who spread the word, and then a publisher, again, a publisher's rep, walks in a store, here's this book by Tom Clancy that all the staff says, oh God, this is great. Maybe you guys could publish this book and take him higher. Again, same story. He ended up, I think, with Putnam. Books later, there we are. That brings up another thing to think about is there are many presses that people haven't thought of exist, like for right. instance, a, a military press or right. in the health sector, there are exactly. presses and they're small and you wouldn't hear about them unless somehow you got one of their books through some route and you look. So an important thing to do is to look when you're browsing books, right? At who has yeah. published them. And yes. by paying attention to what the independent small press is doing, yes, yeah, right. Is, yeah, doing, yeah. is really important. And you would find that out how. Like, well, you can join the IBPA. Authors are members of IBPA as well. Uh -huh. And you can join them. They do have regional meetings around the country when we're not in a pandemic. They also do a publishing university every year in a, in a fairly large location. I think this year it was going to be in the Anaheim Convention Center in, uh, in Southern California. But it's been all over the country. They move it all over the country because they know that the people who want to attend have a limited travel budget, and so they move it every year. Oh, well, but we, anyway, so well, so we learn if we went to one of those big. Oh so well, there are agents and publicists who attend, who make presentations about how to work with a publisher, how to work with an agent, how to develop a business plan, all of those things. Because that's the other thing that if you're going to self-publish or think about organizing yourself as a as a publisher or as a business person, which is what you have to be, then you have to have a business plan. And so there are all kinds of people, professionals, who are available at these kinds of conferences. So I think that one of the best things to do is, is to join the IBPA as an author, but also to subscribe to Forward Magazine and to Poets and Writers, because there's a lot of information about writers' workshops and opportunities in all of those magazines and also in Forward Magazine, there are a lot of the smaller presses whose titles are reviewed there and you can see, oh, that's a publisher who publishes into an, the niche that I'm going for. So maybe I need to find out more about that publisher so I can figure out how to approach that publisher. Right. So it's a lot, I mean, as you have indicated and, and as I have experienced in many of my conversations with my clients as well as other people is that the author's homework is you, writing the book is the least of it. It is the least of it. <laughs> yeah. But I always feel like being in the dark, not knowing these things makes it yeah. all much harder. Yes, and, it does. Yes, uh, it does. Being able to just hear it piece by piece from you and realize who to connect with, how to connect, filling in all those dots makes it sound way more possible than when you're just sitting there thinking, oh, if I can't afford the $10,000 for a publicist, I'm going to go nowhere. There is a route to go somewhere if you take it on. And then maybe you will generate enough money from your first sales to hire somebody to help you with the next parts of it. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. You say that you coach clients as well as consult. Mm -hmm. So tell us about how a person in your position with your experience and enthusiasm for the whole field, how would that help a writer take on this seemingly gigantic second job after they've written their book? Well, the first thing I usually do is to give the writer a realistic assessment of the condition of the book and what I think it needs in terms of to make it marketable. It may be marketable right out of the gate, I mean, which great, but if it still needs a lot of work in terms of the flow of the story, let me give you an example. I worked with an author for a while who didn't like what I had to say. This author had written a book, which he wanted my advice on marketing and selling and all that kind of thing. And I always like to read a good chunk of a book. So I read a good chunk of it. Now, I, I was raised as a Baptist. And so I was teased on the Bible, both the Old Testament and the New Testament. So if somebody's going to start to tell me the story of Jesus and how it was conveyed in the Christian world, I have a lot of information in my head about what the traditional 
the Christian Bible says about what happened, and all the other ancillary material that's been written by scholars around what happened in that period of time. But anyway, this guy's written the story about Jesus and his family, when he has brothers and a sister and all kinds of things. And I'm okay with that. Yeah, I mean, who knows? All those parts, all those guys were left out because they weren't the stars. So, you know, you see, write the book about the star. But then he took a lot of liberties with actual scripture. And I just started to feel like, hmm, I, this doesn't work for me. And it also was overwritten. It was over long. It was like 600 pages when it could have been 300 pages and still been a really good story. And so he wasn't happy with what I said to him. So I gave him my two cents for which he paid me. And we parted ways because I thought, I'm sorry, but I don't feel confident taking this on that I can fairly represent this work if we're not able to work together. And if my opinion about what you've done doesn't make sense to you or you don't want to hear it, which is okay. You don't have to like what I say. I mean, that's life. Lots of people don't like what I say. <laughs> but, you know, and I don't like what a lot of other people say, but so what? You know, it's just, that's the way it is. I'm just curious, do you take it on in, in, in manuscript form if, if, before it's even a book? This was actually, he'd already published it on Amazon. Right. And so he sent me the download of yeah. the book and so, I was able to do it that way. Right. It, that is, is such a true thing that people are, feel so good about having finished their project that they can't take in thought of having to change it and having to yes. it by 300 pages. To the best of your knowledge, has he ever republished it in any form? No. Not that I'm aware of. I mean, it needed, I mean, no reviewer would, would look at it. It's just was so yeah. impossibly. I, I mean, the, the concept of the story, as I said, was great. In fact, that Jesus had brothers and sisters and there was a complicated family relationship. I bought all of that. That was great. Mm -hmm. But then the diversion from the traditional story I thought was way too challenging in a way that the last temptation of Christ was not and because there's been a lot of books written about the life of Jesus mm -hmm. that were not um that were fiction and which have done really well and then made sense but this was so let's say let's say he took you on he said okay she's probably on to something what would have been next for you with him Actually, I did this with a young adult author who was developing a, a story, which I loved. And I still am stupefied that nobody wanted to buy it and publish it because it was just wonderful. It was charming and everything. She approached me early on in the process. She'd written it and then I read and reread and she rewrote and I reread and she rewrote and I reread. And I gave her all of these suggestions of what she could do. And then as well as the connections that she might make once we both agreed that she'd finally whipped it into shape as much as she could whip it into shape. She ended up self-publishing it uh, via Amazon. And I, it's funny, I have not thought about that book for a while, but I loved that book. It was just, it had so many things in it and she got the teenagers just right. And uh, it was- Your knowledge of the industry, why do you think it wasn't picked up for publication? Timing is everything. And sometimes that's just what happens. Yeah. It's just, so that's you know, you're know, you not in the right place at the right time. It's, it may have been a book that didn't make sense to people, although it made a lot of sense to me. I, I really, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, it was one of those cases where when she couldn't find an agent to publish it, I just, I mean, to carry it, to, to represent it, or I think she did actually for a while, but the agent couldn't make a go of it. And I just thought, damn, because she had other ideas about other books to follow. I mean, not with the same characters, but in the same vein as it were. And I just thought, eh. So here's a case where I'm going to ask you this question. If she wasn't defeated by all of this rejection, could she have purchased author copies of the book from Amazon and gone to PTA meetings and uh, youth group meetings and out of the trunk of her car begun to sell this book and then see what happened? She very well might have. 
I don't know because at that moment, she wrote to me many months later after she'd gotten the book established at Amazon and I congratulated her and said, you know, if you ever want to talk to me again, here I am, I'm your biggest fan. And no, you don't know, but I'm just saying, and taking us on that journey, yes, somebody else faced that situation, but had that passion for their book. Yes. Um, I'm just remembering that we could, as authors go, we've got to prove to an editor at some publishing house that this is valuable and here's how I'm going to prove it. Yep. So this many copies with myself. I my book. car, right. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. I have a colleague who's a children's book author and she won a very big prize along with an illustrator very recently. Emory University's Global Health Institute had a contest mm. for children's oh, books. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I remember reading about that award, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you read Beth Bacon as the author, she was the grand prize winner. Mm-hmm. It's a, a picture book, and it's mm-hmm. called COVID-19 Helpers. And mm-hmm. it's very endearing, and the whole slant is about helping very young children understand why people are walking around with masks. Exactly. And right. And people are who are helping us to the point of even the garbage collectors are considered right. essential workers and all that. Yeah. Anyway, when I wrote to congratulate her, and I've spread the word about this winning with by sharing links on Facebook and other places, which now I have a passion for her book. And in yes. my passion, I'm sharing it with yes. my group on, exactly. on Facebook and in my newsletter. So she said, well, thank you for that. And by the way, my I Hate Reading book, which I think she wrote with her kids when they were young, now mm-hmm. when she graduated college, has been picked up by HarperCollins. Yay! And, you know, and so it's like she had a passion. She started her own publishing company and published her books that she had a passion for. She also got a master's degree in writing for children, Mm -hmm. all of this along the way. Mm -hmm. And I I remember writing her a recommendation letter for the program that she got into. And I said, this is, and she helped me get my team together, book designer, interior designer. This is a person who's the whole package. She is the whole package. She's perfect for your program, right? And not only was she perfect for their program? But now look. So yeah, we said, yay, I'm sure she's doing her. her <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, yes, yes. I am too for her because we do support each other in this industry and each other's yes. good luck. But yes. the good luck comes, like when you were saying about educated, a lot of hard work plus some good luck. And, yes. um, but the good luck can't really happen until you're doing the work. Like Correct. that right person shows up at an AA meeting and says, yes. hey, this is a book that has to get beyond this small publisher. It's very, very important to have these cheerleading talks. So I can see that you'd be a great coach and keep any writer <laughs> doing their homework, basically, right? Outlining what the steps are. And then it right. sounds like you did with this person, check in. So whether it's manuscript or Amazon self-published book on forward, you, you use the word in one of our conversations, scouting. You do scouting. Can you talk to us about what that is? Well, scouting is actually, for me, is looking for the right connection for the author or the client. For instance, if I have a publisher client who's looking for distribution, then I do some research by talking to people that I know who are run distribution companies or sales groups and try and figure out what are they open to these days, what's working. The that I do is to try and figure out how to put person A with person B, I mean, how to make that connection. So who makes it? If you're hired to do this for the client, this is coming from that wishful thinking place every author has. Right. <laughs> do you tell the author then how to make it or do you actually make the connection? I actually help them make the connection. I help them make that connection. Yeah. Yeah. I do the, I do the introduction as it were. And then I leave it to the two parties to do whatever right. they're going to do. But I make the introduction. Right. Like a matchmaker. Yeah. Yes. Yes. There you go. A matchmaker. Right. Oh, Marcella, I realize that twice I said we would get to blurbs and I kept putting it off, but here we are almost done. And I would really like to talk a little bit about it, what they are, what they're for. And if we should interest publicists and sales reps by having some, because or whether people wait till their book is done and then go searching for the blurbers. Right, right. Yes, it's important actually for the writer to find people who are credible in their field, in whatever field they are, to provide some endorsement as you go out the door. 
because it helps you find a sales rep, it helps you find a publicist if you've made those connections already. So this is where writers workshops, going to meetings where agents are presented, going to these kinds of meetings because then you meet people. And often the writers workshops feature other published writers, obviously in your field, because if you're writing biographies, you're gonna to go to a workshop that focuses on writing a biography or, or a business book or whatever. So it's important to make those connections so that you could write to author X, Y, and Z in whatever category or subject you're writing about, and, and even fiction, obviously, and ask them to read and comment on what you've written. And it also is possible for you to make some suggestions about what they might say, just to give them a, a boost or so, or give them a pricey of what you've written. So they may not read the whole work, but they may read enough of it to get a sense of it. So it's important because when you approach, when you approach a publisher or a publicist or a sales rep without the endorsement of anyone, it, and if you don't have a track record as a professor in this or that or established historian here or an established writer over here because you write for a newspaper or if you don't have any credibility in the arena about what you're writing, for, uh, I, unless of course you're somebody like who writes gardening, is a gardener and writes gardening columns for a local magazine or a, a local newspaper and you've been doing this for a long time, then you've got some credibility, but still you would want comments from your editor, your readers, that kind of thing. Right. It all helps, it all helps. My next question is gonna be, where would that go? For instance, in, in a marketing plan and, or a book proposal, which has a marketing plan, there's going to be a bio about the author or the answer to the question, why are you the person to write this book? Right. And obviously the experience would come in there. In a real book, a produced book, the blurb is either gonna be on the back cover or front matter or back matter. Right. See it somewhere. But if you haven't had your book actually printed and published mm -hmm. and you're approaching somebody with a manuscript, mm -hmm. would you include it as some pages or in the proposal or yeah, I would have included in the pitch letter. Absolutely. Letter, okay. Or the pitch letter, the cover letter, whatever you would call yeah. it um, right. in the preparatory material. But yeah, I would use it as an advertisement for myself because that's what it is. You want to advertise yourself. Right. You want to promote yourself and that's a way to do it. So I think we're talking here networking too because you said at yeah. conferences you meet people. Right. And it's also true that you know people who know people. And it's, a, it's the time to ask them if you might ask their contact if you might yes. contact them. And yes. although it seems sometimes like a shot in the dark to get these people interested in your work, one of my experiences about the generosity of writers to one another, and yes. if you have a quality book that captures their imagination or their interest in the field, you're gonna have some good luck. Yes. If you just go, oh, you know, I'm, I'm gonna write to Stephen King who writes horror just to see my collection of short horror stories, and with no connection, you right. might not have such good luck because it's gonna go through his publicist and they're gonna be gatekeepers, right. right? But I wrote to Abigail Thomas, whose work I had fallen in love with. She's the author of Safekeeping and mm -hmm. Read Dog Life, What Comes Next and How to Like It. And she just grabbed my heart. Her work just grabbed my heart. And I had written a, a book about loss and mourning. Mm -hmm. And a lot of her books are about the loss of her husband. Mm -hmm. So I just thought, I'll write to her. I was yeah. following her blog. I was reading her work, which is important. If you're going yes. to ask yes. people to blurb you, you yes. best know that you're a fan, what the resonance is. She wrote the most beautiful blurb. And part of it says, this book broke my heart and put it back together again. Mm. So when you ask a good writer to write a blurb, you're going to get yes. something good. But yes. you've got to give something too. And one of them is your interest in that person. All right, so now we know about blurbs. And then for that purpose, and then once the book is in production, people are going to want blurbs. And these days, I've noticed that some blurbs are in the book, but the website for that book contains more blurbs. So in yeah. a way of thinking, you can hardly have too many. Correct, correct, correct. And also what happens too is in the advanced review process, so Publishers Weekly, Forward Magazine, Poets and Writers, other venues that, that issue pre-pub before the book is published reviews, that's a uh, Kirkus, a, the good list goes on and on. So those are also places where reviews can go on the back of the book or go in the press releases that go out with the book when it, 
right. as it's published. Right. And then as you get more and more reviews, they just get added to new editions and added to the publicity sheet and all that sort of thing. And you keep adding it to your website. Okay, so yet another job for the writer. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Yes, yes, yes. Well, or for that lucky person, that lucky minion that the writer has found who is willing to do all of that for a nickel an hour. All right. So it wouldn't be a nickel an hour, but let's, I, let me ask if that's something, this scouting and making connections. If you like a book and you know somebody who would be a good person for that writer, is that part of the networking thing where as in, during your coaching, you might say, well, this would be a good writer to Ask. To approach, right. If if I have some knowledge of that, I certainly would suggest yeah, it. Absolutely. Right. Using your own network is really powerful. In my first book about writing, it was co-authored and was just beginning the process of getting an agent. And a friend of mine said, oh, I know who you should ask because we didn't know who to ask. And she said, her friend was uh, an anchor person on our local news station. Yes. And she said, Julie knows everybody. Let's ask her. Yes. She connected us with our agent, mm -hmm. who I, I kept for many books after that until my books were too much in a, a niche she didn't want to represent right. anymore because like a lot of agents, they got, you'll hear words like, well, I got to pay my mortgage. I need a yes. big name. <laughs> but you never know what's happening with them because years later I was at a conference with her. We were both presenters and we had breakfast together and she said, how come I'm not representing you anymore? Funny <laughs> <laughs> things happen. And I said, well, I guess I haven't written the book that would be out of my niche yet. So mm -hmm. at any rate, I want to thank you for that information. If you already have published your book, in my case, say three or four books that I'm interested right. in getting higher visibility, what would be the starting place? A download or the book itself mailed to you or... What kinds of things do you need to begin working with a client? Either is fine with me. Downloads are good. Although these days, given where I am, which I'm going to be here for the next several months, probably the internet service here is not great. So maybe the physical book will have to do the trick for a while. Or just send me some samples or send me a link to someplace where I can read it online, which is I'm, I'm totally amenable to doing that. So that's fine. You could send me a link to if you've got it online somewhere or on your website. I'm going to tell my members, hurry up and get in touch with Marcella if you need her services because she might get booked fast. You're right. It's been so, so helpful. Really oh, it's been it. fun. Thanks, Sheila. This yeah. has been big fun. Big fun. I liked it a lot. Thank you. Thank you for being with us.